Welcome to Within the Chaos with your host, Rodney Shortridge, and co-host, Robin Dalton. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, you can listen in by calling 516-387-1922, or you can go to the Vibe Radio Network website at blogtalkradio.com forward slash Vibe Radio Network. For deep within the heart of Appalachian Mountains, I'd like to welcome everyone, and thank you for listening to Within the Chaos. My name is Rodney Shortridge. I'll be your host tonight along with my little naughty West Virginian, Robin Dalton. Hey, y'all. Tonight, our special guest is Susan Park. Susan is the Executive Director of the Moundsville Economic Development Council. Uh, I want to give everybody a little information about where me and Robin and uh, uh, Within the Chaos and Black Diamond will be. This month, we just have one event. Uh, It will be at the Garden Day uh, event, Saturday, June 18th, starting at 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., located by the Old Garden High School and by the uh, New Pharmacy School in Oakwood, Virginia. And I'd like to take a second to uh, uh, tell everyone how, you know, our, our life this past weekend it was terrible in Orlando, Florida, and plus the family that lost their two, two-year-old little boy. It's it's a sad time for that area, and it's supposed to be the fun time area, but our hearts go out to all of them. So, Robin, how was your week? Uh, well, short version, it's been a hell of a week. Uh <laughs> Just lots to do, and my car broke down on me, and it seems like it broke down on one of the busiest weeks I had planned. <laughs> it happens. But all in all, it could be worse, so I'm not going to complain. At least not on the radio. I'll complain to you later. <laughs> <laughs> I always get the ass end of it. Oh, have mercy, God. <laughs> Yeah, it's been it's it's been a rough couple of weeks for me. I can't really talk about it. I mean, I really would like to, but I can't. That take it take us about four or five hours for us to sit down and discuss the past couple of weeks, would not it? Yeah, and and it seems like it keeps getting worse. I was just at a meeting before the show, and <laughs> oh, I got a surprise in my life, and wasn't expecting that kicking old boys, but. I got it. Well, uh, we'll get through it. We always do. That's life. You take the good, the bad, and you move on. We learned a lesson, and just another reason why I prefer the dead over the living. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll. I guess we'll move on. We'll we'll, we'll drown our sorrows this weekend together while we're down garden day (laughs) (laughs) well it's my honor to welcome our special guest susan park hello susan and thank you for joining us tonight how are you doing ma'am i'm doing great can you hear me okay i hear you fine now is it suzanne or susan it's suzanne okay Okay, i'm sorry suzanne I, like I said, That's I've a, had a bad, I've had a bad couple of weeks. So if I if I call you something other than what you are, just go ahead, t- line up, and smack me in the back of the head. <laughs> That's you know what I'm not close enough, but that's okay. We'll let it go this time. How's that? Okay. okay. <laughs> well, uh, if you can, tell us about yourself. Okay. Well, I um, I'm actually a West Virginian by birth and a West Virginian by choice. And I think I live uh, in the greatest state on uh, in the, in North America, probably in the world. I haven't traveled the entire world, but uh, I think West Virginia is pretty awesome. And obviously, Moundsville, West Virginia is truly awesome. We have some great things going on in our area. Um, I, I work at the penitentiary. I actually am the executive director 
of the Moundsville Economic Development Council. And that is the organization that in 1996 took over the tours um, for the former West Virginia Penitentiary. Now, the West Virginia Penitentiary was closed in 1995, and the Division of Corrections, uh, some of the employees would go and after work and, and do some tours, but they discovered that that really wasn't their mission, nor did their employees want to continue doing that. They had, you know, their full-time job plus a home life. So there's 12 people on this board of directors that said, you know, we've got this huge building in, in the middle of town. And we've got to do something with it. So they started doing tours, and I came along to help out with some marketing. And what was going to be a 20 hours a month job has turned into 20 hours a day. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> But that's okay. We have a blast. We've, you know, the saying, we've come a long way, baby. We have come a long way. <laughs> oh, I know the feeling there. <laughs> you know, when, when these 12 people took over this facility, they didn't have any money. They only had a vision to, to not let this building um, go downhill. It is, the building is on the National Register of Historic Places. They worked very hard uh, along with, uh, at the time, Catherine Jordan from the West Virginia Division of Culture and History. They worked together and, and did everything they needed to do and got it on the National Register, so that's awesome. And we started out by doing tours to school groups and just people passing by and coming through that, that wanted to see uh, where the inmates had lived. People have a a very unique interest in all things dark. I was just listening to the previous show, um, and and they want to see. You know, look at Alcatraz. That's a, a huge uh, tourist attraction for San Francisco. And in the heart of downtown Philadelphia, you have Eastern State Penitentiary. And uh, then there's Moundsville, West Virginia, where the West Virginia Penitentiary is. So. Um, People are, are curious and interested, and, and we started doing tours, and tours uh, led to people being interested in photographing, and, and, you know, there were two movies, actually, before the prison closed. There were two movies shot there. Did you know that? No, oh, no. I didn't know them. That was, that was one of the questions yeah. I had. <laughs> they, well, see, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of you. Sorry. Davis, um, okay. Davis Grubb who was, um, it was originally from the area, shot for the, the first movie he shot was called Night of the Hunter with Robert Mitchum and a very young Kurt Russell. So look that one up for your archives, Night of the Hunter. It was shot there. And then the second movie that was shot, n not, not um, totally in the prison, but – uh, using the prison and the surrounding area. Again, this is where Davis Grubb was from, and, and he came back to, to do some, some, bring some things to, back to his hometown, was called Fool's Parade, F-O-O-L-S, Fool's Parade. And that was Jimmy Stewart. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did not so, know that. Um, yeah, so now, now you know a little bit of history about the movie. Since then... Uh, the most recent movie uh, that was shot there that was a that went to the box office um, was uh, Out of the Furnace with Christian Bale and Casey Affleck, and that was I think three years ago. Uh, Fool's Parade was shot there in 1971. Wow! Yeah, I'm definitely gonna check those out. <laughs> Oh yeah, I am too. <laughs> uh, night, well, night of the Hunter was actually shot in 1955. Can you believe that? Wow, no. No, I know, I know. So how old so is the prison? Then, how old is the prison? That's a good question. The prison, um, the 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 newly for now, now, now you know that. West Virginia is a state, right? You know we are no longer part of Virginia, right? Right. Yep. I'm born and raised right here in West Virginia. 
Right, right. Well, you know, ESPN gets that wrong, and Fox News has gotten it wrong, and yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So I have to, I have to make sure that we're clear on that. So, so West Virginia seceded. Uh, actually, uh, West Virginia was the only state in the union that was formed out of a uh, that was created as a result of a war, and 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 that was the Civil War. So in 1863, uh, on June 20th, which we're getting ready to have our birthday here in four days. Uh, the state was formed. In 1866, the legislature recognized the need for a facility to incarcerate um, leftover prisoners from the Civil War and, and anybody who got into trouble in the newly formed state. So it was decreed in 1866, and they actually started building it in 1868. The last addition and final building, now there's been a lot of reconstruction and, and redos inside the facility, but the last of the, uh, the last actual building of the structure was completed, now get this, it was completed in 1959. So almost 100 years of building, almost. Wow. wow. How many people did it have? Do you know right off? You know, it depends on what year, what was going on in the world at the time. You know, during the Great Depression, there yeah. was a lot of inmates housed there. Um, there, there. You know, I've heard that there could have been as many as two thousand people there at one point in time. Um, at one point, at one point, there were females and males housed in the facility. Not obviously in the same. Uh, cell block, right? But there were men and women at the same time in the facility. Hey, and guess who was an inmate at the facility at one point in time? Charles Manson's mother. Wow. Really? I didn't know that. Yep. Yeah, Charles Manson's mother was an inmate there, and I, uh, I guess I think it was in the 30s or the 40s, and I'm, I'm not 100% sure about the dates, but she was an inmate there, and as a young child, very young child, Charles Manson lived with um, family members in the area, in the, 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 in the Marshall County area, and we actually have in our museum area of the prison we actually have a letter that was written by Charles Manson, and he was requesting to be transferred to the West Virginia State Penitentiary. He said he wanted to, to, to come there and be closer to family. Obviously, yeah. that didn't happen. See, I'm uh, learning all kinds of new stuff. I had no idea. <laughs> aren't yeah, yeah, yeah. He um he he yeah, he 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 wanted to like I said, he has family he had I don't know if they're still alive, but he did have family in the area. So he, he didn't he did not get transferred back. First of all, we are a state facility and his crimes uh were committed in California, so there's no he's in a California state prison, but we're not gonna you know, uh, move from state to state just because somebody wants to be closer to home, particularly a mass murderer. So um, yeah. that didn't happen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So now I will tell you, I'll tell you something else. Here's, here's a legend that, and a story of the penitentiary that you'll hear that is not true. Many, somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, legend has it that Moundsville had the choice of having West Virginia University or the Moundsville Prison or the West Virginia State Penitentiary built in Moundsville. That was supposedly, that was not, that is not true. That is not true. That never ever was an option. Um, the Moundsville Prison was built in Moundsville because it was close to, at the time, the state capitol, which was in Wheeling. Huh. Well, I got a question. Uh, why was it named Moundsville? Uh, why is the town or that area named Moundsville? Oh, you've never been to Moundsville, have you? Well, I mean, I've seen it on the History Channel and stuff like that. Why? But I just, you know, for people that don't know, 
I, I was just wanting to know, you know. Okay, you, okay. So, you, so you got okay. Mm -hmm. Moundsville is actually right across the street from the penitentiary. I, I'm, and I'm and I'm not kidding you. Right across the street is the mound. There is a huge mound, which is an ancient burial site for. Um, it, it's the largest conical type burial mound in the United States. Okay, it, it's 62 feet high, and you can walk up to the top of it. It's 62 feet high, and it's 200 and 240, 50 feet in diameter. And it is where there are ancient um, Indians. Now, these are not Native American Indians, okay? These are not Native American Indians. These Indians were before the Native Americans. Um, they are buried in there. Now, again, legend has it, and I have a, a, a deer friend who has done a lot of history and research on this, that some of the bodies buried in there are over seven feet tall. These were giant people that are buried there. So, so that's the largest one, but there are several other small mounds in the area. Now, West Virginia Division of Culture and History uh, has custody, if you will, of the mound, and it is doing some great things there. So that's where the name Moundsville came from because of the mounds. Holy crap. See, I'm learning all kinds of stuff tonight, and I live in West Virginia. <laughs> well, you need to make a trip. You need to make oh, a trip. Oh, yeah, I most definitely do. <laughs> we, we really want to. We want to come up there and do an investigation, if that's possible, one day, because, you know, we have a, I have my own uh, paranormal group, and I also do this radio show, so uh, I stay a little busy, but Hey, to come up to Moundsville would be an honor. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, come on up because um, we, you know, we 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 do have uh, we have a lot of great things going on there. We have. Um, do you want to ask me questions, or do you want me to go on? Because I can talk all day about this place. All right, well, <laughs> You, the, um, we, we have we have a lot of different things going on there. First of all, we do have the paranormal things, but let me start with what's what's important and how we get to the paranormal, and that is the history of the facility. You know, the history of the facility it, it, it encompasses our daytime tours, and we do daytime tours. Um, in the summer, we're open seven days a week. And we open at 10, and we, uh, the last tour leaves the lobby at 4 o'clock. And our tours are 90 minutes long. So you get a good working knowledge of the history of the facility. And we want to make sure that we're keeping – we want to make sure that we are maintaining a credible history of the facility. So we do that by um, – obviously training our tour guides, but you know what else we have is we have tour guides that work on our staff that were actually correctional officers in the facility when it was open. Well, wow. that's one way to keep it going. <laughs> it is, and it's, and it's great because they can put their personal touch on things about the areas they worked in, about the inmates they, they, they worked, um, they worked uh, to – to keep in place, I'll put it that way, and I'll explain that in just a moment. But, you know, the inmates that were there, that they, they were with day in and day out. They, they talk a lot about, about their experiences and, and the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, the inmates love to tell their version of what it was like to live in the penitentiary. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times, their sense of reality is skewed. So we believe and feel that the most important thing we can do is to honor the people that went to work there every day and put their lives on the line because, you know, it, they, they were, the, the penitentiary was maximum security. The worst of the worst criminals lived there. Um, so we, we, we try very, very hard to maintain the credibility of the history of the facility by making sure we are factual in what we're telling our visitors. Okay. From that history, then from that history has, has been born the paranormal side of the facility. 
and I, I know, and I've been, I know, I've been I know you're busy. very interested in it, Rodney. I know you're very oh, interested yeah. in it. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> hey, uh, we got a caller that wants to ask you a question. Uh, uh, are you okay with that? Absolutely. Just don't make it too difficult on me. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me put them on. Uh, hello, Scott. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, you're speaking with Susan, and go ahead and ask your question. Suzanne. Suzanne, uh, Suzanne, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. Hi, Scott. Hi, Suzanne. How are you? I'm great. How are you today? Uh, I'm I'm doing just wonderful. Uh, I was just curious. You were speaking of the paranormal in the in the prison, um, but I was curious. You mentioned the like this the legend of a seven foot people in the mounds. Has there ever been any claims of like seven foot people in the prison? That's it. You know, uh, okay. And here's here's what I will tell you from my personal experience um, about that. Um, and, and this will come up later in the discussion. But at one point in time, I was fortunate enough to walk through the prison with a known medium that worked with the uh, Allegheny uh, County Sheriff's Department in, in, out of Pennsylvania. And she described um, a very bloody field where the prison is uh, in, in her walkthrough. And she is describing this. The field and the area there was part of the battlegrounds where the, the mound is built. Um, obviously, you know, the Indians were, were around there. This was a sacred site of theirs. But, you know, how we are with our sacred uh, sites, how things uh, there's a lot of, of, of fighting and things that go on around, even today, around sacred places. But in any case, um, she described uh, battles that took place there and a very, very large and tall people involved in those. Now, not everyone was. Not everyone was, was large and tall, but that's what she described. Now, was there ever a seven-foot inmate at the prison? I don't know, and I'm not sure if that's exactly what you were asking, but I do know the, the medium that walked through with us um, indicated that, that, that on the grounds at some point in time during a very bloody battle, there were some very, very tall people involved. Fair enough. I appreciate your answer. Um, my second question would be, do you believe it? Have you ever experienced Do, anything yourself? Ah, gosh. You know, I hate when people ask me this question. Let me preface this by saying um, I have a, a very um, dear friend who teaches uh, at a community college, a paranormal investigative um, a, a class, and he has explained that you have to be susceptible to this, okay? I am a very hyper- um, my mind is constantly on the move type person. And he has indicated that I don't settle enough to experience what's going on around me because I'm always focused on 50 other things that I have going on. But let me, let me say this to you, what I have experienced. Um, now, many people on, my, on our staff have experienced a lot of really dramatic things, but this is what I've experienced. I was with a group one night, and it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, and um, we had experienced um, windows rattling and, and things going on like that on a very, very still night when we shouldn't have had anything like that. So they had gone into the kitchen area of the dining hall, and I was really tired, and I thought, okay, I'm going to let them go back there and – Maybe I'll see something through the, the windows into the kitchen. And so I was sitting in the middle of the dining hall. And I've learned from paranormal investigators that if you're going to take pictures, take three pictures of the same location. Because if there's activity or something going on there, it, it will move around in the picture or it might be in a, one picture and not in another. So I had just gotten a new phone, so I took pictures with my cell phone. I'm sitting in there just taking pictures, like panoramic shots around the room. I'd take three pictures and move a few feet and take three pictures and go around that way. When I got back to the lobby, I got an orb, um, a, light, a light streak that was going through the picture. The first picture, it was just barely noticeable in the bottom left-hand corner. And the second picture, it wasn't quite midway through 
at a diagonal. And the third picture, it was just going out of the top right-hand corner of the picture, um, which was really cool for me because I was by myself. I didn't see it visually, but I captured it on my phone. Now, my office is also in a building behind the walls. Um, the building that I am in is called the Prison Industries Building, but it's been um, many buildings have been built inside the walls. There was textile building, there was a water tower, there was um, uh, a hospital in the dining hall, and buildings have been built and torn down and built and torn down. The building that I'm in, um, we remodeled some areas and built classrooms and, and, and bathrooms, and we took pictures during the remodel process. Two of the classrooms, pictures are always clear, nothing wrong. The bathroom, there were always orbs in the pictures, always orbs. No matter what time of the day we took the pictures, no matter what kind of construction was going on, whether there were people in the pictures or not, the bathroom pictures were always full of orbs. And that bathroom has always had problems with the plumbing. There will be water running in there. We had the automatic paper towel dispensers. I went in there one day, and there were paper towels all over the floor. I mean, it's, oh, it's wow. funny. Wow. So would yeah. you say that the haunted stuff is the main focus of the prison? Um. I would say that the paranormal activities and events that we have are the most dramatic part of the prison, just because of of, of the drama of being in there at night, uh, in the dark, in this huge facility. Um, you know, it, that's a huge part of our business. That business really catapulted us into the black, if you will, because just doing tours as standalones, we were just barely making it, you know. And then right. when the paranormal, um, when the whole paranormal, it, it just exploded when that happened. And, and I, I say that because we just have people that, I mean, people that come back year after year. We have some people that come two and three times a year to investigate there. Um, and there is a lot of activity going on there. I don't personally see it. I don't personally always experience. I experience things going on around me. Like I said, the, the rattling windows, and, and I've, I've walked down halls before, you know, and you feel the cold area. Um, I, I was, at one point in time, I was walking through with the medium, and, and we, were through, we went through with a film crew that was there um, from a little TV show called MTV. You may have heard of them, MTV. Mm. Anybody? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, you've heard of MTV. They, that's basically what put us on the paranormal map, was MTV came to town, and they shot a pilot for their series called Fear. And the, uh, the crew was there, and we were walking through with this medium, and we're in North Hall, which is where the worst of the worst inmates were housed 23, hour, 23 hours in a day. And so she's describing what happens when an entity might, you might experience something, you know, the coldness on the back of your neck, your hair standing up, you might feel giddy at sometimes, you know, like lightheaded. And, and she's going through all this and she's looking at one of the guys in the crew and she's explaining all this. And then she finally said, and I was standing beside of him and she looked at him and she said, are you experiencing any of that? And he said, no, I'm not. And she said, okay, well, there's a gentleman standing beside of you. He's a very tall gentleman. He has his elbow on your shoulder. And she went on to describe in detail this gentleman standing there, which nobody could see except her. And uh, one of the other people in the crew witnessed this. And I'm standing beside him, and he keeps, you know, looking – like looking at me out of the corner of his eye, trying not to turn his head. He's going, can you see him? Can you see him? And no, I can't. And we both <laughs> wanted so much to be able to experience this, but um, it was fun. It, it was, um, it was neat to, it's really neat to see the pictures and, mm -hmm. and to, to, to see, hear the video or hear the audio that comes back from, from people that, that set up their recorders within the facility. It's really neat to see and hear some of that stuff. Oh, I'd say so. Well, well, has has any of the workers or the volunteers there had any uh, personal experiences that they've told oh, you about? Oh, 
Absolutely, absolutely. And it goes on all of the time. Actually, two of our employees, as a result of their paranormal work, um, have established a, a group and a YouTube channel called Paranormal Quest. And they have a lot of, 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 um, a lot of footage from their experiences on site there and, and what has happened, whether it's, it's audio recordings or whether it's actual video um, from experiences that have happened there. So, so absolutely. Um, you know, we have uh, our, our, our manager there, Thomas Stiles, um, he talks about his first huge experience. He was there with a TV crew, and I'm, I cannot remember which crew it was with. And they were shooting footage, and they were just getting ready to take down their cameras. And they happened to look on the monitor, and there was a ball of fire in this one area where they had a camera set up. So they took off running down to where this, this – this, and he describes it. He says it looks like a ball that was on fire and it was just kind of bouncing through the hallway and, and it would shoot down the hall and, and, and he, they witnessed that. And, and it was just, it was amazing um, what they saw and, 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 and it didn't, you know, he said it was bouncing around down there for a while. And then finally it just shot down the hall and went away. Um, they caught it on video and, and they, they, they witnessed it live as it, as not just on the TV. They ran down the hall to where it was and witnessed it. We oh, had people, awesome. I know, isn't that awesome? We've had people that have gotten scratched while they've been in there. Um, we've had people um, that 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 have had, I, I won't say a full blown seizures, but we have had people that have passed out, and and people there are some people um, that have have been there that that talks about their experience that they're almost it's almost like they're paralyzed like they know exactly what's going on around them but they can't move for several seconds even minutes um so they are there there's all kinds of awesome things that happen there are those the people on vh1 i'm sorry were those the people that were on vh1 no it was mtv Oh, no, I wasn't confusing the two. I thought maybe, like, if people were getting really silly about it, they were on VH1. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, I'm still back in the paranormal stuff. No, I, I, you know, I don't know about that. Uh, I'm sure that we've uh, we've been a little bit of everywhere. Um but we've had some great experiences. We've had um, – we have a resident shadow man that has been identified. He has been seen by – multiple people and groups and and there was even a group that came in and tried to debunk him and they couldn't they couldn't because of what happened but a funny story about our shadow man we um you know in 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 october the month of october we have a haunted house we actually create in the basement of the facility a great you know special effects light sound fog the whole 10 yards and so we have that going on and and it's several about three or four years ago we we also started doing something that we call the north walk the north walk is totally separate from our haunted house and it is a walk through the northern part of our facility that is known to have the most paranormal activity so we'll take groups and we'll take you through 45 minutes it's, it's about the the length of time you're in there and you go through with a tour guide and a flashlight no actors no special effects no lights other than the flashlight well one weekend we had some girls that had gotten behind in their tour and they were hanging out and they were trying to catch up and they were going down a set of stairs and they couldn't find the flashlight on their camera to, to turn the flashlight on, or maybe they didn't have one downloaded. I don't know. Anyway, they decided they would go down the steps by using their camera, and they were using the flash to, to light up the steps and go a few steps, and then they'd take another picture, and the flash would come on. And so when they got home and they were looking through the pictures and trying to delete the pictures on their phone, they realized at the bottom of the steps, as they were going down the steps, there was a shadow man standing at the bottom of the steps as they were going down. And wow. she had him in a couple of 
Yeah, yeah. And she and she emailed me. She was so excited. And she said, we didn't see this person. There was no one there. You know, she's going on and on and on about it. And, I'm, you know, I emailed her back. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. That's our shadow man. He hangs out in that hallway. I mean, it's it is a big deal. But it was, you know, she was so excited about it. It was it's great. And we've had that happen several different times. Well, have you had anybody have an experience to the point it scared them so bad that they quit? <laughs> No, we have not had that. We 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 we've not had anybody quit because of an experience. We have had people who have not been able to go on tour because of the the bad bad feelings that they the vibes that they get from the place. Right. Um, we've had people that have just and that's that's during the day when the the, the sun's shining and the lights are on. Um, we have people that that have said, you know what, I, I just don't think I can do this, and and they they turn around and, and leave. Um, so it, there's really something about, and it's not just in the prison itself. On the south end of the prison, um, in 1959, when they finished everything, they also built the warden a home on the south end of the prison. Up until that time, the warden actually lived, and his family lived in the facility. Did you know that? No, I no. had no idea. Wow. Yeah, the warden, the warden and his family actually lived in the facility. We uh, have have uh, talked to family members that um, grew up <laughs> uh, living in the facility, and it, and it was it was considered a social center of the community. There was always activities going on there. There were plays, and they had a band, and they had um, sporting events as as well as theatrical things going on there um it, it was it was a very uh, very important part of the community as far as social goes but anyway they built the warden this residence and and i and i was on facebook one night up, updating our page and and this person contacted me and she said i have a question i've seen a lot of paranormal shows about the prison why doesn't someone do a show about the warden's residence. And I said, well, actually, there are still offices. There are offices in the warden's residence now. And I went on to describe my office was upstairs and there's other offices downstairs. And so we were describing, I was describing that to her. And she said, oh, well, she said, I grew, I lived there for a few years. I grew up in that area. My father was a warden there. I said, That's really interesting. She said, yes, my bedroom was over the garage and I said that's so ironic my that's exactly where my office is so she begins to describe the closet and and we're talking about everything and she said to me have you seen the shadow man <laughs> I, said, <Wow. laughs> I said I said the one at the prison we have I have lots of pictures of him but I've never personally met him ha 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 and she said no the one that lives in the house oh, oh. Yeah, and I said, uh, no. So we're talking online, and so she describes to me um, the the shadow person that, that lived in the house when she was growing up there. She saw him. Her brother, his bedroom was beside where you – there's an unfinished attic. It's almost the size of, of the house. It's, it's I mean, the, almost the, you know, the whole floor. Um, it's, it's, it's just huge, and – and there are steps that go up to it. And she said her brother's bedroom was beside where you walk up the steps to go to the attic. And the door was always closed. And he could hear somebody going up the steps. And he would look out and there would be no one there. And she said she, would, uh, she was in her bedroom one afternoon and looked up and in, there was no door on her closet at that time. And she said she looked up and in her, the doorway into her closet, there was a shadow person standing there. So, wow. uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, so I took all that in. I was like, okay, that's cool. So I, and I work all hours of the day and night. I work in the evenings and I'm there in the house by myself a lot. And um, so I was working one evening and I heard the commode flush in the hallway bathroom upstairs. And I said, okay, here's the deal. If someone's here, that's okay. Just I'm working. You leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone. But please don't follow me in the bathroom. If you need to use it, there's one down there. 
I've got one here in my office. So I stated that agreement, right? You know, just to alleviate my fear because I was a little concerned at that point. So about three months after this conversation I had with the the gal that used to live there, um, one of the, the uh, a paranormal friend of the facility came to my office. She's written books and she was sitting talking with me and she kept looking over my shoulder, which was where my computer monitor was. And she keeps looking over my shoulder as she's talking to me. And finally she says, Suzanne, I don't mean to alarm you, but there's two shadows near your computer monitor and they mean you no harm. One is fully formed and the other is not fully formed. And so she goes on to tell me about those and she says, please don't be alarmed. They mean you no harm. And I said, yeah, I've heard about them. I said, if you can talk to them, would you please tell them to use the bathroom down the hall and stay out of my bathroom? Um, <laughs> so, so, so have she, you felt threatened right there? I mean, with all this, have you felt threatened? No, absolutely never, ever felt threatened. Never felt threatened at all. Never. Mm -mm. No. I don't, I don't, I I don't know of anyone who has ever felt that there are bad entities, I mean, horrible bad entities living in the, residing at the facility. Um, They, they might talk trash, and, and if you go to Paranormal Quest's YouTube channel, you can hear some of that. They might talk some trash, but no one has ever been gone screaming out of the facility, you know, because there's, there's a horrific um, entity there. I'm not saying they're nice. They're not Casper the Friendly Ghost either. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but, but I've never had anybody tell me, I mean, the place is creepy and scary in the daytime, you know, um, and it's even creepier and scarier at night just because of what it is and what you know used to live there. But I will tell you this, the inmates that lived there, and, and I, I'm assuming that this is accurate for most correctional facilities, the inmates um, do not want to die behind the walls because they believe that if you do, your spirit will never leave. So a very, very dear friend who worked in the medical field and worked his way up through the ranks and became commissioner for the Division of Corrections for the state of West Virginia, he's since passed away. His name was Mr. Paul Kirby. He, he said that when he was working in the healthcare side of the facility, that they would do what they could to keep the inmates, if, if the inmate was sick enough to die or had been hurt or whatever. They would do what they could to keep the inmate alive until they got him out of the walls and into an ambulance on the way to the hospital. Um, because they inmate, that was one thing that inmates believe, at least at our facility, that if you, if you died, that your spirit never left the facility. Oh, that's great that they would do that. So, um, what would you like to see happen in the future with the prison? Um, you know, we we are so fortunate um, with what has ha, with what we've been able to do so far. It's a huge facility. The facility is still owned by the state of West Virginia. Now we have a 25 year lease on the facility that runs through 2020. Two or 23, something like, maybe it's 24. I'm not really sure. But we do have a 25-year lease on the facility. We're about midway through it, maybe a little bit more. What we really mm-hmm. would like to do is to be able to restore the center section of the facility or, or what we call the old administration area. It is where the warden and his family used to live. There were also there there are four stories in that area, and it's the if you look at pictures of the facility, it's the tall gothic thing that goes up, and it looks almost like a a, a castle, you know. It's it's oh, okay. it's beautiful, um, but the interior of that is has deteriorated so much, and there were so many 
um, remodelings done. You know, we got to add offices. We got to take offices away. We got to, you know, there were so many things that were done through the years that I don't know that we would ever know exactly how it was when it was first built. But we would love to be able to restore that center area of the facility. And, and it would take several million dollars just because, first of all, we have to start at the top and work our way down. Because the, if we don't get the roof fixed and in, in, in a good, um, stable um, situation, then the, there's no sense in working below it because there's still going to be leaks. And with a, you know, with any roof, you're going to have leaks. But this one is a really right. big roof. <laughs> and the roofs are flat. So that's a challenge. You know, when you have flat roofs and you have, you know, a couple feet of snow and, you know, there's really – it, it it's hard on the uh, structure facility, but that's what we would love to see. Um, we we really obviously want to continue for many many years, um, long after me, to be able to share the history of the facility with anyone and everyone that wants to come visit. Obviously, um, right. We want to still have we still want to have fun with the paranormal investigations. We just think that's something that's never going to go away. Um, and we think that there's always something new. You know, technology has come so far um, in in all aspects of our lives. But as you know, and and also in paranormal investigating. Oh yeah, you know, it's so it's so much fun. Well, um, what kind so of events we, do you host at the prison? I mean, I know you did a haunted house. Does that help with cost? Absolutely, absolutely, it does. But it is a big place, and and you know, we don't generate millions of dollars we are able to pay the bills and we're right. able to to do things you know the building i'm in used to be the prison industries building and 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 uh we were able to um back at, in 99 2001 up through that area um we were able to get um federal and state grants to turn that into um a, a place where corrections and law enforcement officers could come and take classes and train and that still goes on today to a lesser degree but it's also used as an event center for the community because there really wasn't a place that's that's large enough to hold large functions big fundraisers and things like that so it still is the facility is still a, a a social center of the community if you will so there's a lot of things that go on there but still you know you've got a we don't heat the prison but we do heat and cool the lobby and museum area the prison's just too large to try and heat and cool um but right. the 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 the, Mount, the the training center building, the Moundsville Center is what we call it, where the old prison industries is. That is air conditioned. We put air conditioner in there to make it um, air conditioning in there to make it more more um, attractive for people to have summer events there, wedding receptions and things like that. So we did that. We built a picnic shelter. So so school groups and 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 birthday parties and graduation parties, people can rent that and, and come inside the walls and have, have events. Um, you know, we do the haunted house. We have zombie paintball going on. We just opened our first escape room upstairs. So we're doing all kinds of things. I know it's so much fun. We're doing all kinds of things to generate interest and to keep people coming and to do things, but, but to undertake a major um, restoration is going to take a lot of money, and, and that's we can't generate. And, and it's not something you can do for a couple months and then wait for another year and do a couple more months and wait for another year. You know, it's something that has to happen in in succession. You know, phase one. It, you, it's not something you start and wait till you get enough money to redo it. So we're always looking for for grants and opportunities, but because the facility is owned by the state and we lease it, we still have state guidelines that we have to abide by, which means a bidding process. It, it's a whole another ball of red tape and wax that we have to no. go through to, to, do, to do what we need to do. And it's not a bad process. It's just a very long and lengthy process. So even if we would find a grant for several million dollars that would restore it, we still have to fall under the guidelines of the state and we have to make sure all their guidelines are met too. Right. Now as far as like you have all this stuff going on, are your event tickets, do you have like a uh, 
set price for the different different things you can go in for, or do you have like pack absolutely absolutely we do we have um we have our day tours um you know there are prices um for day tours twelve dollars for adults nine dollars for senior citizens and six dollars for children ages six those are walk ins you can walk in June July and August seven days a week and take a tour the um we close December. January, February, December, January, February, and March were closed because it's too cold to tour in there. Um, and the rest oh. of the months that were open, we are closed on Mondays. But you can walk in and do a tour any of the days that were open. Now, our paranormal events, our tickets for those are sold online. And you just go to our website, which is wvpentours.com. That's W V P E N. T O U R S dot com, and you can you just go to tickets and you pick the event you want to attend and and um, purchase your tickets online and and that's how you do your paranormal events, the escape room and haunted house. Um, because if you wait and buy your tickets at the door, you might not get in. Right now, on your events for your paranormal events, do y'all ever offer um, private investigations? Absolutely. We have two types of overnight events. One is called ghost adventures, and that is what we call our public ghost hunts. And those, um, we just sell, you can buy, you know, you and, and a friend could come, or you and 10 friends could come. We sell up to 60 tickets for that event. And you come in at 11 o'clock and you leave at 6 in the morning. So you're there, have the opportunity to investigate all night long. Um, wow. You can leave anytime you want. You just can't come back in. Then we have um, what's called our PPI, and that stands for Private Paranormal Investigations. And that is a purchase of one ticket, and that ticket cost is $950. But you can bring up to 20 people in. And that is what most paranormal investigative teams do. They buy a PPI ticket, which you, you just do a $250 deposit, a $200 deposit, and then we invoice you for the remaining amount, and you just have to pay it before your event. And, and that's what most paranormal investigative teams do is they, that way they have it for their team. They can set their cameras up, and they don't have to worry about people walking through um, as they're recording or things like that. So, um, and we have some people that come in, two or three people, and just do an investigation online, or we'll have a group of 20 people. It just depends on the seriousness of what you want to do and, and how many people you've got on your team. Awesome. Well, how do, you, how do you advertise for all your events? Do you just put it out in the newspapers or what? We um, Social media is, and I think that's probably um, probably the number one place I would say that, that a lot of people go to. Um we, you know, before social media became huge, it was a lot of radio and, and billboards. And as social media became more important, we started um, drifting towards that. We still do print. Um, we still do radio. Um, we don't do billboards uh, anymore. I don't think we've done any of those in several years. Um, but, and we do, we do some things um, with some national programs like the veterans, I, I have, there's a, there's a, um, one of their publications. They, we have a lot of, of veteran motorcycle groups that come through and tour our facility. They, they love to, the West Virginia Hills are great for motorcycle, um, rides and, and, um, and just, this is a great stop for them along the way. So, um, and, and you know, it's tr a lot of it is trial and error, um, there's a, not a lot of abandoned prisons that have turned into tourist attractions in the U.S. other than Alcatraz and Mansfield Reformatory in Ohio and, and then in Philadelphia, Eastern State, and there's us. There's not a lot of us out there. So, and we're not in a huge metropolitan area. You know, I talk to the people in Philadelphia, and I'm like, how do you do this? Like, we're, they, we just throw up a billboard. Everybody comes. I mean, they've got, you know, a couple hundred thousand people in their city, you know. Um, they don't need to advertise outside of their city. They, they do well with that. We're, we're looking at 50 miles an hour as far as our advertising goes. So. Why? Um, it, well, is there anything in the community that people can help you all with? 
Uh, come and visit. Come and visit. The more you visit, um, the, the, the better life is for everybody. You know, you, you learn about the history. We call it um, the West Virginia Penitentiary, where history meets mystery. So come and visit, because when you come and visit, you buy a ticket, you know, you're, you're keeping us in business and going, and then by going out and sharing it, more people will come and visit. Um, Mondays during the summer, we do something called History Mystery Mondays, because like I said, typically we're closed on Mondays the rest of the month. And so on Mon- History Mystery Mondays, you get a little bit of the paranormal along with the regular historical tour. So people love that day. They, they love to to end their vacation with a History Mystery Monday tour at the facility. Well, we got a few more minutes left. Uh, is there anything that uh, you'd like to tell the listeners that we uh, that you didn't cover or we didn't ask? Uh, I mean, uh, platform's yours. Go ahead and. Okay. Well, you know what? Not only and and this is what's really here's what's really funny about the facility. The facility lends itself to history, to paranormal events. We also have a heritage festival that takes place inside the walls the second weekend in September. It's called the Elizabethtown Festival because the area, there were two communities that were settled back in the early, early, early 1800s. One was Elizabethtown and one was Moundsville. And the Elizabethtown daughter married the Moundsville son or vice versa. I can't remember the exact story. And the two cities became one known as Moundsville. Isn't that funny? So we celebrate Elizabethtown with the early 1800s Heritage Festival. Can we do that the second weekend in September? The next weekend in September, we do a zombie walk. So we go from a Heritage Festival to the apocalypse, you know, to zombies. (laughs) Uh, It's it's great. It, It just lends itself to so many different opportunities and then after the zombie walk weekend the the next weekend is our we open for our um haunted house so it's a lot of fun and you know the haunted house isn't just about making money for us the first two weekends of our haunted house which is the last weekend in september and the first weekend in october for every ticket we sell online we pick four charities and one charity is assigned to a Friday night, another charity a Saturday night, the first weekend, and the same thing for the second weekend. So four charities have a night. And we donate $5 for every ticket sold online to a specific charity. Um, we pick two local charities and two national. And our examples are one of the, one of the local charities was um, it's called Helping Heroes, and they, they build um, homes and they help veterans in the area. And then another charity, which was uh, it's local, but it's a national charity, it was Autism Speaks. So for every ticket sold online the night that's assigned to your charity, we will give that charity $5. doesn't matter whether you sent them to our website or not. Anything sold online, we give you $5. So, you know, we give away several thousand dollars um, each each year to charities in conjunction with our haunted house. Wow. Well, I know our time's up. Uh, we got about a minute and 20 seconds. So I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I've learned so much tonight, and I can't wait to get up there and and. I'm going to say you're coming up, right? <laughs> Oh, I'm going to, we're going to try to make plans to come up there, definitely. Oh, yeah. We will right. be working on that. <laughs> Again, right, I thank well, you join so us, join, join us on our Facebook pages, West Virginia Penitentiary. And also we have a Facebook page for the escape room, Escape the Pen. So uh, join us, um, learn more about us, and um, come visit. Oh, we will. We will. Again, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, we, we do appreciate it. Well, that's thank us. you. Uh, that's I've been so excited. Thank you so much. Oh, thank thank you. you so much, Suzanne. Well, that's a, uh, that's Happy. it for us tonight. I want to thank Suzanne uh, Park for coming on the show, and I thank everyone who took the time to listen and take part in our show. I'd like to give a big shout out to the Vibe Radio Network, also to all the first responders and our men and women in armed ser- services. Thank you for your service. Uh, our guest for next Thursday night, June 23rd, will be. Uh, the Black Diamond Paranormal Society, East Tennessee chapter leader, Scott Osmondson. 
So uh, everyone turn in next week. Uh, hopefully we'll have another exciting show. I'll start at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Until then, everyone be safe and have a Why trust the parts pros at Advance Auto? Because if there's one thing they know, it's parts. Thank you for calling Advance Auto Parts and Battery. This is Taryn. I can help you. I'm wondering if you guys do battery installations? Absolutely. It's free to charge. And uh, do you do wiper installations too? Uh, yes, that is also free to charge. Wow, all that's free. We also do alternator and starter testing for free. Wow, you guys pretty much do everything. Uh, yes. Any chance you guys handle dry cleaning? Uh, well, not quite everything. Advance Auto Parts. We know everything about auto parts. And right now, get a $20 Speed Perks reward with any battery purchase.